Good morning, praise the Lord, and welcome everyone uh, to class uh, for a class on study of First Timothy, Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Uh, we're studying the book of First Timothy, and we are at uh, chapter four, verse thirteen. So we'll continue from chapter four, verse thirteen today, and move on to chapter five. Before we do that, can uh, one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Shall we pray? This shed of days, we want to say thank you. The Lion of Tribe of Judah want to appreciate you for the gift of life, for the opportunity to learn at your feet. Thank you for lecture. Thank you for my colleague, or my student, my classmate. Thank you for the management of this school. Thank you, Lord, because you are the only one who will take us around in the whole world for your namesake in the access of preaching your gospel. Father, what we want to learn here today may be impactful, may be useful for us in the name of Jesus. Thank you, my Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, success. So in um, First Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, uh, Paul is telling Timothy uh, not to let anyone despise him of his youth, uh, to set an example to the believers in word, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in uh, purity. Okay, so he's basically talking here about um, how uh, the the, uh, the false doctrines, false teachers. Um, who are there, how to deal with them. He's spoken about in the previous chapter how to uh, choose um, uh, leaders, how to choose bishops and deacons, um, the spiritual leaders in the church. And now he's going on to, in chapter 4, talk about the false teachers and what are the things that uh, young Timothy should keep in mind, what he should do, what he shouldn't be doing. Um, and he's talking here about godliness, and he says in um, verse 8 that, um, you know, uh, godliness uh, is of great gain. Uh, bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that is now and that of which is to um, come. Okay, And then he talks about how, you know, he will suffer things and reproach and... Um, <clears throat> you know, how people would uh, point fingers at him, talk bad about him. But, uh, you know, he's saying, you know, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, who is your uh, Savior, who would give you the great uh, strength to overcome these uh, challenges. Okay. And then in verse 11, he is going on to command him. Um, and he's saying, command and teach. What are the things that he needs to command people? What he needs to teach them? Um, you know, uh, so he's telling Timothy that when you enter the uh, pulpit, you know, teach, command the word of God um, without any fear. Don't have fear of man. Okay. And then he goes on in verse 12 to say that even though Timothy was young, he encourages him to set an example to the believers. And what are the areas that he's telling him to set an example in? Okay, what are the areas he's telling a young Timothy to set an example in? Can we hear some responses, please? It's in your Bibles in verse 12, okay, in love, conduct, okay. Okay, thank you, Jeffina. In word, in faith, and in purity. Okay, so he's saying set an example in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, and in uh, faith. Okay, so uh, in purity and holy living. Okay, so he's saying to Timothy that he needs to model purity both in his conduct 
uh, with young women that he will you know be talking about in first in timothy first timothy chapter 5 in the next chapter and he's saying in his uh, thought life okay uh, so purity is not just outward issues but a heart issue and uh, you know uh, how we looked at how uh, christ taught us that you know if we we can not just commit adultery in the very act that we do but that's in the old testament the new testament is that even if you look lustfully at a woman even in our thoughts even in our eyes you know he's saying just a thought uh, uh, and look you know we've already committed adultery in our um, heart so he's talking about how we also we can learn here as ministers of god how we need to model godliness in every area of our life, okay? And he's saying, Timothy, when you model this kind of godliness, it will also provoke others to godliness, okay? And we see this even in the life of Jesus. The very reason God became man is not just to come and die on the cross for our sins, but also um, the importance of the reason for the incarnation is so that you know um god can reveal himself to man in a tangible way in a way that we can see experience handle like one john um chapter one uh, says you know or i think it's one john chapter one or one john chapter five where paul says uh, john says you know testifies that we have seen him we have handled him we have uh, been with him we have fellowshiped with him okay so jesus came to um, reveal the heart of the Father to us, and he also came to model how, you know, though he was fully human, yet he was sinless, he did not yield to temptation, how he showed forgiveness, how he showed love, how he showed compassion, and how he did signs, miracles, and wonders in the frailties, in the limitations, how he limited himself to uh, human frailties and weaknesses. And in the same way, we too can do that so he's paul is telling timothy hey timothy when you model all of these things you know it'll provoke others also to godliness okay so we'll move on to verse uh, 13 um so can somebody read verses 13 to verse 16 please be good to hear some online voices can somebody please read verses 13 to verse 16 of First Timothy chapter 4? Uh, verse 13 to 16, right? Maybe? Yes, verse 13 to 16 of First Timothy chapter 4, yes. Okay. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take it to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Amen. Thank you, Zelatoli. So in verse 13, he says, Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Okay? So what is he talking about here? Reading? Give attention to reading. What is he saying here about reading? Sorry? Reading the Word of God, reading the Scripture, reading the Old Testament, Torah, the laws. <clears throat> What is he talking about? Exhortation. What does exhortation mean? <clears throat> what does exhortation mean? Telling someone to do something, okay? Exhortation means basically preach the word of God. You know, encourage, inspire, and comfort people from Scripture. And uh, he's saying, you know, give attention to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. What is doctrine? What is doctrine? 
the right teachings of the church or of Christians or the doctrine of Christ. Okay, thank you. Doctrine basically means teaching. A teaching various topics, various uh, points or topics in the scripture or, you know, teaching various aspects or topics uh, to people. Okay, so he's saying give attention to these things. So he's saying don't give attention to what the false teachers are talking about, but give attention to reading, to exhortation and to uh, doctrine. So uh, we know that in the in in Paul's time and even in the Old Testament, people were not privileged like we are to have the Bible in our hands, the Old and the New Testament. You know, um, there were only f uh, very f uh, privileged few who were, had access to the Old Testament Torah to the Scripture, um, and many of them were illiterate, and very few owned these manuscripts. So uh, what was done was they basically would come and gather together. We know that we read this uh, in Ezra and Nehemiah when the scriptures were read. The people would come stand the whole day and they would stand and listen. That was the respect they gave to uh, scripture, the reading of scripture. And so he's saying, you know, uh, read scripture. And not just read, but also preach, encourage from the scripture, comfort from the scripture, and teach the various doctrines, the various topics that are there in the uh, uh, in 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 scripture. Okay, and he says, you know, these things have to be done in the church. So, how what can we learn from this in our uh, context today? Is that in our churches, three things must happen. Okay, we need to read the scripture. We need to preach from scripture and we need to teach the word of God. Okay. We just don't talk about philosophies and ideologies and nice stories from the pulpit, or we just don't use pulpit time to get back at people or to talk about, you know, all the ministries or the things that God is doing through us. But uh, pulpit time is basically to read scripture, preach, and teach the word of God. Okay. Pulpit time is not for uh, to tell stories. It's not for uh, you know talk about ourselves and what we are doing, how God is using us. Not to talk about what is happening around in the world or philosophies or ideologies or what we read in certain books. It's just talking about what the Scripture is saying, uh, getting people uh, to grow in the Word of God. Okay, verse fourteen. Um, Paul is encouraging Timothy not to neglect the gifts that is in him. So he said, don't neglect the gift that is in you. And how did he receive these gifts? Paul is saying here, how, what, how did he receive these gifts? To the prophecy and to? By laying, laying of hands. Laying of hands. Thank you, Jeffina and Lubega. Okay. So he's saying, you know, which you've received in the laying of hands. It's not that spiritual gifts are received only when somebody lays hands on us, or it's not only when somebody prophesies over you. We know spiritual gifts are from God. He gives it to us, whether it's the gifts of the Spirit, or it is the, uh, the, the ministry office gifts, or the membership gifts that are there. It's all given to us by God, okay, but uh, we can also spiritual gifts can also be imparted, okay. Uh, spiritual gifts have can be imparted and also they can be trained, okay. So some things can be taught and some things have to be caught, okay. Some things are to be taught, T A U G H T, and some things have to be caught. So you know, impartation is one means when we can, um, you know. Um, uh, be trained, taught, receive, catch uh, the gifts, uh, the spiritual things, uh, the spiritual gifts that uh, can be imparted to um, us. So he's saying, you know, um, don't neglect the gifts that you have, uh, Timothy, okay, which you have received basically when maybe it was Timothy's ordination service when the church elders laid their hands on him and maybe recognized God's uh, calling on his life to ministry and it would have been accompanied by prophecy. So he's saying, think about those things and, you know, uh, uh, exercise those gifts. Now, spiritual gifts are given to us by God, it can also, you know, be imparted. Uh, it can, we can also be trained in that, you know, uh, to, you, to fan up the gifts, to utilize those gifts, to 
cause those kids to grow. But it is very, very important that we just don't go around having people lay hands on us, you know, or being close to people who are flowing mightily in the gifts so that we can learn, we can be taught how to use those gifts and not just have people lay hands on us so that the gifts can be imparted, but it's important that we exercise those gifts. So what is the point in you know, God blessing us with spiritual gifts? What's the point in us uh, running behind people and have everybody laying their hands on us and imparting those gifts? What is the point in uh, you know, um, working alongside with people who are flowing mightily in the gifts we're not just going to just receive it like that. We are, you know, going to receive it, but there's no point, you know, uh, if we don't exercise those gifts. So we need to exercise the spiritual gifts, use it, you know, um, so that, you know, you can be used mightily by uh, God. Okay. So he's saying, you know, uh, don't neglect those gifts that have been given um, to you. Okay. And, uh, don't mistake this verse by saying that, hey, spiritual gifts can be received only when people lay hands on us, okay, or, uh, you know, when it is taught to us or when we are connected with people who are flowing in the gifts. No, gifts of God come from God. He alone is the source. He is the only uh, source, okay. Like we read in John chapter 3, verse 27, where uh, John is saying, a man can receive nothing, unless it has been given to him from heaven, okay? So don't think that spiritual gifts are only given when people lay hands or you associate with people with, who are flowing in the gifts, but it's the only source of spiritual gifts or gifts is from uh, God, okay? However, God uses people to activate, which means activate means get these gifts started in us, you know, or uh, acknowledge those gifts in us. So, um, or it, the impartation also can be for more grace in those gifts so that we can flow mightily, uh, anointing on those existing gifts that are already there in our lives. So impartation can basically bring more grace and anointing that on the gifts that are already existing in our um uh, lives. So receiving the activation of these gifts or the impartation adds to the strength and uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in your uh, life. And this can happen, of course, through laying on of hands, prayer, uh, receiving it through uh, ministry, okay, and also by associating with us or closely working with those who are flowing in these gifts. So very important to uh, understand this verse because many of them think that it's only of, uh, you know, laying on of hands of the elders or through prophecy that we receive gifts. No, the only source is God who gives us the gifts. But, you know, these gifts that are in us put in by, uh, by God can be activated um, and, you know, can uh, more grace and uh, anointing can be imparted through impartation, okay? Verse 15, he says, meditate on these things, give yourself entirely to them, and your progress may be evident to all. So he's calling Timothy to meditate on God's work and meditate on the work of God in his life. Now, here, med the word meditation is not talking about the Eastern meditation where it is emptying your mind. But when we talk about meditating in the scripture, it's talking about filling our minds uh, with God's word, with his truth. God's word is the truth and the truth sets us free. So don't think about meditation as emptying your mind. Okay, it's not uh, like uh, what is the goal of the Eastern meditation, but here it's filling our minds with God's word and the truth. So what is Paul encouraging Timothy here? What is Paul encouraging Timothy here? Can we hear some voices, please, some answers? What is Paul encouraging Timothy? In verse 15. Anyone in class? He's telling him 
to meditate on this in the above things he has told him that uh, to give entirely to there and progress uh, la, la, la. yeah i think he's encouraging him to to meditate on the scripture and doing the right doctrine just as we've discussed in in the in the 13 and 14 yes thank you lubega so he's saying meditate or seriously think ponder about the things that he has spoken to him uh, so far he says, give, give, uh, he's telling Timothy, give yourself entirely to doing these things. And he's saying, if you do these things, you will grow and progress. And your growth and progress will be seen by all. Okay. Um, so your progress, his progress will be evident to all. Okay. Sometimes our progress is not seen in our lives because we are not giving ourselves entirely uh, in our pursuit of God or in pursuing God and doing his will if you don't pursue god uh, don't have an intimate relationship fellowship with him not doing his will then it is uh, you know the fruit is not seen only we abide in the vine can we bear much fruit okay so uh, you know we fall short sometimes uh, of um, you know of uh, bearing fruit or showing growth and progress because we are very passive in our christian life um, we do not give uh, uh, we do not give ourselves entirely to doing God's will, and Jesus warns us about this passive attitude in the parable of the talents. You know, uh, where the servant who did nothing was severely rebuked. Okay, so don't have a passive attitude. When you have a passive attitude, when you don't give yourself and do nothing about the gifts and the talents God has given to you you know, uh, you, uh, your progress, your growth cannot be seen. The second thing, uh, we, uh, you know, we, another scripture passage that we can look uh, connected with this verse is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, where Paul is saying, By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Okay. So, you know, Paul is saying, hey, I have the abundant grace of God. You know, the overflowing grace of God. Okay. And I'm who I am. It's all because of the grace of God. God. But he's saying, I hey, I don't just take this grace of God for granted. I just don't take this grace of God and just sit down and do nothing. But what look at what he says. But I labored, you know, I labored more abundantly than they all. So, you know, for, for Paul to say that uh, he labored more abundantly than they all means compared to all of the people around him who co-laborers is some it's, just, it's a very bold statement and an assertion to make, you know. But he's saying, yes, I have worked hard. I have labored hard. You know, uh, labor is basically very strenuous, difficult, hard work that he has done. And uh, he's saying, you know, um, uh, it is because, again, that labor is because of the grace of God. So Paul knew that spiritual growth just did not happen like this. It is the gift of God, the grace of God that was bestowed on him. And it, this gift and grace flows more in abundance on those who labor hard, who use those gifts, who work hard. And that is why in the parable of the talents, we also see the one who had five talents, you know, he was given more and he was welcomed in. Okay. But the one who did not do anything about the one talent, you know, that one talent was also taken away and it was thrown into the darkness, which was neat, uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth, basically talking about hell. Okay. So, yes, the grace of God is there for us, but we need to labor hard. Only when you labor hard, you know, can you experience an abundance, more abundance of the grace of God and the gift of uh, God. Okay. That is why Jesus says, to whom... Uh, more is given, you know, more is expected, okay? So the more you do things, the more you multiply, the more you um, receive. You don't do anything about it. What is there, you is also will, will also be taken. So the, the 
the equation here is if you want to see abundance of God's grace, abundance of his anointing, abundance of his um, blessing and overflowing, you have to be sincere in what he has given to you and um, be good stewards of what he's given to you. And also he's looking for multiplication. He's looking for growth. You need to multiply what he's given to you. Okay. We'll move on to verse 16. He says, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Okay. So Paul is instructing Timothy to watch over his own life again. And what he's teaching, he's reiterating it. And at the same time, he's saying, you know, um, uh, be careful to remember that, uh, you know, you uh, don't refrain from giving your entire self, putting in your entire effort, okay? Because when you give off your entire effort, you know, you earn uh, the grace, the, the, the blessings of God, okay? So uh, when we do this, we need to be mindful of another truth that, you know, uh, when we give ourselves entirely to God, or you know, we put in all of our effort, we're laboring very hard, you know, um, uh, a hard work and, uh, you know, uh, the hard work that we do, the hard work and the hard work, that means we are working with all of our heart, it never puts God in a place where he owes us something, okay? Um, it, it means what I'm meaning. Uh, what I'm meaning to say is that you know we don't come to a place. You say, "Hey, God, you know I am working so hard. I'm laboring so hard. I'm putting all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, you know, in laboring. You have to do this. You have to bless. You have to multiply. You have to cause my church to grow to five thousand, to ten thousand. You have to do these mighty signs, miracles, and wonders. You have to raise up a big, big building of a church and do this and that. You know, God." Uh, he, God does not owe us anything, okay? Uh, in, in, even if we work really hard, put in all of our hard work, our hard work, it never puts God in the place where he owes us something, okay? But us putting in or giving ourselves entirely to the work of God, you know, our entire effort should be out of gratitude and in honor to God who has already done so much for us. Okay, so that should be our attitude. That should be our mindset. Not that I work hard, not keeping in the back of my mind the parable of the talent. Say, hey, I do, uh, you know, I have five talents. I have to multiply it either which way, hook or crook. You know, I do it, I get five more. God is not looking for hook or crook. He's looking for honesty and integrity. He's looking for our hard attitudes, you know. But even when we do that, we know God, we don't stand in a place where, you know, God owes us uh, something, okay? Uh, we don't demand things from him or we don't use it uh, to twist his hand to give us what we want, okay? But we do it out of a gratitude and honor to God because he's called us and we're serving him uh, because of all that he's already done and what he's, what he's going to do in and through our lives, okay? So he's saying, take heed. You know, so Timothy and every pastor must examine two areas uh, concerning our lives, you know, uh, or two things concerning uh, our lives or two great areas of concern that he's mentioning here. One is life and one is doctrine. Okay. So all of us as pastors, as ministers in the kingdom of God, you know, and, you know, Paul's writing Timothy is saying must examine constantly, we must examine the two great areas of concern, one's life and one's doctrine, okay? And if you fail to constantly examine these two great concerns, it would mean danger for both ourselves, okay, and for the people that we are ministering, to ourselves and the congregation. So here it is Timothy and his congregation can also mean you and me and our congregation, okay? And if we don't give heed to the way we live our lives, you know, um, uh, Paul is telling Timothy, you, you know, you might suffer shipwreck of your faith, like he spoke in First Timothy chapter 1, verse 19, okay? And he's saying without giving to heed to doctrine, you know, you can lead yourself astray from the faith and you can also lead others uh, 
from uh, receiving the gift of salvation into their own um, lives. Okay. Um, and then he says, those who hear Timothy as a pastor, you know, uh, preaching and teaching, or when he's talking, they should constantly hear doctrine. Okay, they should constantly hear the doctrine. They should constantly hear the truth in God's words. So Timothy's primary call is not to entertain people, amuse people, or even help with practical things. It is to present the biblical doctrine and to give heed to that doctrine. Okay, if you hear of uh, many people's sermons, sadly, you know, many people's sermons are basically a lot of stories, what God did to this person, that person through me. Uh, but be very little of uh, scripture or what God is doing about the nature of God, the work of God, you know, or attesting other scripture passages, teaching from uh, scripture. It can just be philosophies, it can be poetry, it can be uh, various things just to appease people's ears, okay, or to entertain them. So preaching is not entertaining, but it is to basically teach. Uh, it's to present the biblical doctrines so that people can give heed to that um, doctrine, okay? Um, so, he's telling Timothy, you know, watch your life, watch over yourself and what you preach and teach. So, what we can learn here for our lives is, you know, as people who have been entrusted with the gospel, each one of us, whether we are called to preach or teach or called to be pastors or, you know, uh, you know, in the in the business world, uh, we are just working in the in the world. Uh, we are all a royal priesthood, and all of us have been given and trusted the truth, the gospel, and all of us are called to preach and teach and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the Great Commission. Okay, and as spiritual leaders, as people who are called a royal priesthood. We need this ability to be self-governing, okay? And we can only be self-governing with the help of the Holy Spirit. And we need to be uh, watching over our lives and our doctrines, watching over what we teach and uh, preach. And when we do that, we will not only protect ourselves, not only protect our, our, uh, our faith uh, and keeping our faith from being shipwrecked, but also would bless those who listen and lead them into salvation. Okay, so that is First Timothy chapter four. Anyone has any questions, any doubts before we move on to First Timothy chapter five? No questions, no doubts, anything you want to, anything needs to be clarified, any clarity on anything that you need. So first of all, good, good mom. Thank you, Lubega. Okay, then we'll move to First Timothy chapter 5, okay. Um, We'll read the entire the passage. There are 25 verses, so we are more than five of us in the class. So can I request five of you to please read five verses each, please? Can we begin? Chapter 5, First Timothy chapter 5, verse 1 to verse 5. Do not rebuke an older man, but exalt him as a father and and young men as brothers, the older women as mothers, the young men, women, the younger as sisters, with all purity. Honor widows who are really widows, but if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Now, she who is really a widow and left alone, trust in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. Amen. Thank you, Lubega. Can someone else read verses 6 to 10, please? But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives, and these things command that they may be blameless. But if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than 
an unbeliever. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number, and not un unless she has been the wife of one man, well reported for good works, if she was brought up, uh, if she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the sand's feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. Thank you, Zalatoli. Can someone else read verses 11 to 15, please? Anyone else like to read 11 to verse 15? But refuse the younger widows, for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from, from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busy bodies, saying things which they ought, they ought not. Therefore, I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage houses, manage house, give no opportunity to the adversaries to speak reproach, reproachfully, for some have already turned aside after certain. Amen. Thank you, Lubega. Anyone else reading from verse 16 to 20, please? If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them. And do not let the church be burdened, that it may relieve those who are really widows. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. And that the labor is worthy of its wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning, rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest of that the rest also may fear. Amen. Thank you, Subhashis. Um, can someone else read verses twenty-one to twenty-five? The last uh, few verses in this chapter five. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things which are without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those of some men follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. Amen. Thank you, John Paul. So what is uh, Paul writing here in chapter 5? Who is he writing about here in chapter 5? Okay, he's talking about widows. What else is he talking, addressing here? I think he's talking about uh, the women in church who are less privileged to have lost their beloved ones either when they are young or when they are old. Okay, he's talking about women, he's talking about widows, talking about leaders. Yes. What else is he basically addressing here in this chapter? Um, I feel like he's just talking about how to handle people, <laughs> the different people over in the church. And uh, he's young and he needs someone to say all this. Okay, he's talking about how to handle different people in the church. Yes. He's basically talking about responsibilities. You know, the church's responsibility, the believer's responsibility, the saints' uh, uh, 
you know their responsibilities okay because sometimes uh, we see that in the in, in the early church even now we, the people think it's the responsibility of the church to do way uh, certain things so what do you think people's expectations are about what the church has to do in terms of washing away their responsibility what do you think they think or they feel oh this is the church's responsibility these are the things that they have to do any thoughts Come on, all of you are part of church, so you should know. What do you think people's mindset is when it comes to what the church has to do for them or for their family? Uh, I'll just share a few things. Like I've seen in the villages, like when there is a Uh, financial crisis in in the family for education they obviously expect the pastor to pay sometimes i've seen this not it doesn't happen everywhere but uh, the way they approach the way they ask uh, which is not something a pastor actually has has to do but uh, there are people who leave churches because of that and uh, yeah so that's one of the things i've seen in the interior parts of, of the milan How many of you all agree to this? What Jeffina said. Do you think it's a problem only in the rural churches? No. Okay, it's everywhere. Yes, I think even in the urban churches, people are expecting if they are out of job, if you know uh, and if they can't pay their children's fees they expect the church to help them you know if they are fi- facing financial crutches you know they uh, uh, you know crunches they want the church to uh, help them uh, also uh, when it comes to you know um, if some there is some sickness in the family they expect even the church to pay them yes the church can help in certain cases church is there to help but some people take advantage of that uh, you know uh, freedom or uh, the fellowship that they are part of what else what are the areas what are the areas um i think they also expect some positions after after some time like if they are a, a member for like 3 4 years and uh, I, even this i don't know like if it happens every year but if a new member comes and you give them some responsibilities they feel like why give me i've been here for 4 uh, years 5 years uh, especially uh, like in a church where there are treasurers and uh, they obviously expect them to be and creates a lot of division division in the church uh, which is also i think it's it's in the hands of the pastor he has to know who's really faithful and he can choose uh, the right ones doesn't mean you've been here for 5 years or 6 years it's about the grace that god has got at people yes very true i mean uh, people want the uh, positions in the church you know in various areas they think if they are accountants they have to be accountant in the church as well if um, you know they are running a catering business then the church has to give them the catering orders for all of their uh, programs yes uh, visiting them yes subashi says visiting them also i've seen you know some people if they work in certain firms or uh, sorry offices or they're running a business say for example they're working in a in a print uh, express a print media a printing press 
you know, then they would expect the pastor for all his programs to go to their printing press and give them the uh, business. Or if there is a construction happening in the church and there is somebody who is in the construction business, they expect the pastor to give them the, uh, you know, uh, the order or the, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the construction work that is to be happening. Or somebody is in the painting business or furniture, you know, they expect the church to buy it from them, but not take quotes from everyone, see who's the best, and then you know, they don't like it. They get very upset and they even leave church. Okay. Uh, anything else? Any other areas? I think a major area of concern for when uh, being part of the ch children's ministry is I feel that the parents, most parents think that it's the church who has to, you know, uh, teach their children about spiritual things. And uh, I feel that the parents think they, their responsibility is for academics. You know, they r rarely give in or look after their children's spiritual upbringing. And that's why we have most of our children's church ministers being very sad or frustrated or disappointed at the parents' uh, uh, participation. They say they don't even get them their children to learn even a one-line memory verse or to read the scripture passages that we've given them to the week or to get them to practice what they have um, learned. So I think... That is one area where most people think it's the, our spiritual growth, spiritual upbringing is only the responsibility of the church. Yes, it's a responsibility of the church, but it's not the only responsibility. It's our own responsibility as parents, as individuals also to grow in the Lord. Okay. So here in this um, uh, chapter 5, just for um, our study, you know, based on what Paul is addressing, we can uh, divide this into six different categories. The first one is uh, uh, verses 1 to 3, where he's talking about relationships within the church. Verses 4 to 8, he's talking about believers' responsibility to their own family. Verses 9 to 16, he's talking about the church's responsibility towards widows. Verses 17 to 20, he's talking about leading, how to lead spiritual leaders. Verses 21 to 23, he's talking about, um, you know, just about spiritual leaders. He's just sharing some personal notes. Sorry. Verses 24 and 25, he's talking about the outcomes. Okay. So we'll begin by looking at uh, verses 1 to verse 3, where he's talking about uh, the believers' uh, relationship within the church. So can somebody please again read verses 1? First Timothy chapter 5, verse 1 to 3. Do not rebuke an old man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters with all purity. Honor widows who are really widows. So here Paul is uh, giving instructions to Timothy uh, because he's young. He's talking about how to relate to people of different ages. Even as he is a pastor, as a leader, a spiritual overseer, a spiritual leader, okay. But uh, it's you know these instructions can also apply to our own lives, even as we relate to one another in God's house in the church, okay. How we need to treat one another, how we need to honor one another. So he says, "Do not rebuke." Now the ancient Greek word for rebuke. Um, is not the normal word for rebuke that is used here. Okay, this is the only place this word is used uh, compared to the other places where the word rebuke is used in the New Testament. This is an entirely different word that he used uh, 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 about this word rebuke, and um, and this is the only place that he uses this um, you know uh, other word for rebuke. Uh, in Greek, in the New Testament here. Um, and uh, it, the word rebuke literally means to strike 
at. Okay, so Timothy was told not to attack older men with words, but he's telling them to treat them with respect, just like he would treat a younger man, uh, younger men or younger women, or how he would respect younger brothers or younger men. Okay, we'll stop here and we'll come back after the break and we'll continue with first Timothy chapter five, verse one. 